Listen, I'm so glad you came today for this installment of Gates of Change. Normally, my pulpit comes out right here. There's even tape on the stage to show where it goes, so we get it right there, center, so all the campuses can see it. It's not crooked, driving the OCD people crazy. Uh, but today, I told them to bring me a different instrument um, to illustrate this gate of change, because today we're going to go through the gate of conversation. Now, I know that word is archaic. Because we live in the age of comments. <laughs> uh, we live in the age of outrage. And uh, we so hide behind virtual walls and digital personas and screens that sometimes we have forgotten how to talk. Um, and, and many young men will never know what it was like to do this <laughs> and to have to still and steady your heart to talk to a girl on the other end of the line. People don't talk, people don't talk no more. All they do is this. Have you noticed? And uh, yet we find that God is a conversationalist. Prove it to you. The very cadence of creation is call and response. God spoke, and it was. Everything we see is a result of something that God spoke. And so to walk with God is to involve yourself in a conversation. Because I really want to model my ministry and my life after the ministry of Jesus. And as obvious as that should sound, I've missed it in so many ways. Um, I missed it because sometimes I was so focused on what Jesus said and his words that I missed some of the context that he said those words in. And a lot of it was ignorance. And I slowed down recently, and I noticed a pattern in Jesus' ministry. Something that he did is so simple on the surface, you will miss it if you are not looking for it. I'll show it to you, and by the time I show it to you a few different ways, uh, you'll pick right up on it, and you'll wonder, how did I never see that before? But the first one I thought I would mention, there are a lot of these I could have pulled from, but uh, since I tried to memorize the Sermon on the Mount one time from Matthew 5 through 7, you know, he really starts preaching around about verse 3. But verse 1 says something. I never thought much about it before. It just says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He, he sat down to teach, and the Bible says at the end of that whole discourse that the people were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority, not as one of their teachers of the law. He broke their expectations by virtue of the power of his wisdom. That was the first one I wanted to read you. The second one is in Luke chapter 4. It's kind of cool because Jesus is preaching in his hometown of Nazareth, Nazareth, and he was uh, Nazareth. I was thinking Lazarus and Nazareth together. It just kind of came out a bit of a mashup. But he, uh, he, he stood up and took the scroll, and he read his scripture, and he was quoting from Isaiah 61. He read it, but he stopped because he was talking about the Spirit of the Lord is on me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, open the eyes of the blind, recovery of sight. And he said that it is the year of the Lord's favor. And after he had said that, look at Luke 4, verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and what did he do next? Talk to me. This is a conversation. All of y'all who look at me like some kind of clown to entertain you, I am not used to that. I am a conversational preacher. I need you to talk back. My questions are not rhetorical. I really expect an answer. What did he do after he rolled up the scroll? Jesus he sat down. And, and the funny thing was, he sat down before he got to their favorite part of the scripture. Because after he said it's the year of the Lord's favor, it said the day of vengeance of our God. And they really wanted him to be the kind of Messiah that would repay all of their enemies. But before he got to that point, because he is full of grace and truth, he rolled up the scroll, said it's the year of the Lord's favor, and he sat down. And when he sat down, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, hanging on his every word, because he was the word, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God's conversation with humanity, so that if we see him, we see the Father. You got time for one more? The Bible says in Hebrews that every priest that came before Jesus, the great high priest, would stand. This is around about verse 
11 of Hebrews chapter 10. And, and day after day, these human priests in the religious system would, would stand and offer sacrifices. And, and they would stand day after day and perform religious duties. And day after day, they would make atonement for the people's sins day after day, performing these religious duties. Again and again, day after day, they would stand and offer the same sacrifices, the bulls and the goats and the, and the pigeons and, and, and everything else they could find to kill, to try to shed blood, to cover their iniquities. They would do it day after day, again and again, which can never take away sins. But, verse 12 says, when this priest, speaking of Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, what did he do? So I got good news for you. He didn't sit down because he was tired. He sat down because he was finished. He sat down because everything that needed to be done for you to be right with God was accomplished on that cross. And when he did it, when he stretched his arms and shed his blood and breathed his last, got up from the grave with all power in his hand, trampling over death, hell, and the grave, he sat down at the right hand of God to make his enemies his footstool. Pretty cool that he's still seated today. No matter how anxious the world is, Jesus is not pacing the halls of heaven, wondering what I'm going to do about this. Do me a favor. Touch somebody say, he's still seated. It's interesting to me that he, he sat down. But my favorite time that Jesus sat down is recorded in John chapter 4. This one's a little different because he sat down in a strange place. Uh, he sat down in a town called Samaria. The Bible says now he had to go through Samaria. Uh, technically, he didn't have to do anything. He is God. But there was an appointment that he wanted to keep in Samaria that he did not give to the disciples to put on the itinerary. And uh, he knew about it. He knew about it. He had a reason, a conversation that was waiting in Samaria. And when he came to a town, verse 5, in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, because he's fully God and he's fully man, so he got tired. Jesus had to blow his nose. Jesus had to sleep. Jesus cried as a baby. You know the Christmas carol, little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes? It's wrong. It's pretty, but it's not true. He cried. Screamed his head off. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? A quick question. How many of you believe that Jesus is the answer? Just raise your hand if you believe that. So if Jesus is the answer, what is he doing asking a question? To a woman, as a rabbi who's not supposed to speak to a woman, to a woman who we will find out in the course of the conversation, we're not going to read it today, but if we did, we'd find out she had questionable conduct. A woman who had not only questionable behavioral conduct, but a completely different belief system than Jesus. A different belief system, a different moral code, um, and a different ethnicity. So why would Jesus sit down and start a conversation, something that the church isn't very good at? It's something that the Savior came to do, to start conversations with people who were different. And we've lost the art of conversation in our culture today. I can't speak to the whole world, but at least in America, we don't do conversation anymore. We do comments. Y'all aren't going to help me. You're going to leave me right up here on this stool by myself. I don't even have a pulpit to hide behind. We do comments. We do comments. One of my friends told me he calls when people go on and leave nasty comments but won't say it to your face. He calls that internet courage. We, 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 we live our lives sometimes in echo chambers where digital algorithms are force-feeding us our preconceived prejudice and reinforcing our biases. 
And then we will sit down and watch news programming that is owned by the same conglomerate that sells us our antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication where they will gather people on a panel to talk about a cultural or social issue and they'll call it a conversation, but it's really a cage match because we don't know how to have a conversation. And the church is not much better sometimes because we're always wanting to know, where do we stand on the issue? Well, we do need to take a stand. And there are standards, and I preached about them two weeks ago, and you should have been here because I preached it real hard. I didn't even have a stool. They didn't need one. Standing for truth and standing for, for what's right and standing for justice and turning back the battle at the gate and all of that is important. But Nelson Mandela once said that where you stand depends on where you sit. Your beliefs are shaped by your background. And sometimes we, we speak before we sit. Sometimes as a preacher, I've been better at developing my one-liners than listening to the worldview of somebody who was different than me. And I believe that Jesus gives us a model here of conversation. He asks this woman a question, and the, the woman, verse 9, was really shocked. She said, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. I'm a woman. You're a man. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Yet the Savior sat by the well and spoke with this woman. And he said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And they had a conversation. And because of that conversation, the gates to the entire region of Samaria were open for the year of the Lord's favor. And it didn't start with a statement that Jesus made. It started with a conversation. He sat down. I, uh, I had the chance to do this recently. I got to sit down with somebody who on the surface seemed really different uh, from me, um, but wasn't that different at all. Actually, um, I'm from a town called Monk's Corner, South Carolina. Proud to be from the corner. <laughs> Learned manners in the corner. Learned how to make people feel special from being from a small town. Population 7,885, according to the 2010 U.S. Census. Only reason I know that, I was recently on Wikipedia looking at Monk's Corner to see if I was on the section called Notable People from Monk's Corner. <laughs> My ego got the best of me one day, and I wanted to see if I made it. And I got good news, church. I made it. I was right there on the Monk's Corner Wikipedia page. Praise his holy name forever, and blessed be God in the highest. Glory, glory. And there were some other people on there, too, a few that I knew of, and then one guy that I had never heard of on there called Charlemagne the God. Well, see, I'd never heard of him, and I clicked on him because I figured that wasn't his given name. Maybe I knew him by something different, because we were born like right around the same year, and we're from this little town. Surely I knew him, and I found out that his first name was Leonard McKelvey. Well, see, I didn't know a Leonard. I knew uh, Tamisha McKelvey, J.J. McKelvey, Larry McKelvey. Didn't know Leonard who later became Charlemagne. I didn't know him. I started asking around to some people that grew up in Monk's Corner with me. Do you know this Charlemagne, the God who came from Monk's Corner? And one of them said to me, yeah, I've seen him. He has this big radio guy, but you wouldn't like him. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have anything in common with him. I said, why not? Because that just makes me want to get to know him more, that you think I won't like him, because I made a grown-up decision not to let other people's opinions inform who I will and won't like. But that's up to you. I said, why not? They said, well, he's like the uh, Howard Stern of hip hop radio. So now you know I had to watch him. Now you know I'm straight from Wikipedia to YouTube. 
and I watched him on his show called The Breakfast Club. Now, this was a while back. I watched a few of his interviews. I thought, man, this guy, he's shocking. We, we probably see a lot of things differently, but I, I liked him. I liked him. I thought he was a great communicator. I liked the fact that he would say some things that maybe other people wouldn't say. I thought that was kind of cool. I, I, I knew that we were probably different from a religious standpoint. I definitely knew when his book Black Privilege came out that we were different in terms of our skin color, but I, I already knew that pretty quickly. Uh, my friend Eric, who grew up in Monk's Corner with me, he bought the book Black Privilege uh, that Charlemagne had put out, uh, telling a little bit of his story, and said, you got to read this book that Charlemagne wrote. Charlemagne, who is Lenard, who happened to also be Larry, which was the guy that I knew, but his real name was Lenard, but he went by Larry, and then he became Charlemagne, so I knew him all along. <laughs> and uh, I picked up the book, and I read it in a day, and some of the language was colorful. I think some of the stories were um, interesting, and some of the ways he saw the world were different, but I thought, we came from the same town and went to the same school, and we never even talked to each other that I remember, and uh, I wondered what would happen if we talked. And I went to our video team. I said, I'd love to do something with Charlemagne. Y'all know Charlemagne? They all knew Charlemagne. I said, I'd love to do something with Charlemagne. I'd love to go back to Monk's Corner and go around town and tell our stories to each other just about growing up in the same town, going and doing different things and having different perspectives, and not preach to each other, not debate each other. I like to just talk to a guy that was from my same town. And They said, well, that would be cool. I said, but I don't really know him. We've talked a few times on social media, but I don't really know him. I went to get my hair cut an hour later, and my barber fly tie said, do you know Charlemagne? He was here in Charlotte last night for an event, and he was asking about you, and he wanted me to give you his phone number so, so you guys could talk, but I don't know what for, but here's his number. Well, I know what for. That's a God wink. God's pseudonym is coincidence. And so we started a conversation, and it took a little time, but I found out that Charlemagne was going to be in Monk's Corner doing a turkey drive at our old high school. And I said, Well, what if I brought a video crew and picked you up? And what if we went around and talked? Just talk. Just talk. I know we're different. What if we just talked? And he was kind enough to sit with me. And I learned a lot that day. And I think he liked it too. And some of the footage we had to edit out because it's not exactly Sunday morning church material. <laughs> But I want you to go with me now to Monk's Corner. You've always wanted to go. Well, let's load up the whole church. And I want to ask that you don't slip out. There's no popcorn in the lobby. But for the next 30 minutes, I want us to have a conversation and find some common ground. Touch the person next to you. Say, let's go to the corner. Come on. You want me to drive, or? Well, I, I think you should drive us. Thanks for doing this. You got a whole unit, huh? <laughs> yeah. We're not playing. Y'all shoot a lot of stuff? It's like catfish. Y'all even got the car set up with the, mm -hmm. the video camera. What did you think it was? <laughs> so we're going to go to where he grew up. You ready? Let's go. Take us there. Let's do it. It's always crazy when I come to um, Berkeley High School, though, because I got kicked out of this school. Yeah, so you're giving out turkeys at the same school you got kicked out of? Giving out turkeys at the same How's school I got kicked out of. It feels like uh, growth. It feels like evolution. It feels like it don't matter how you start. It's about how you, how you finish, you know? Did you ever get in a fight at Country Park? I got into a fight right here. About, uh, this, this is West End. Now, I had a girlfriend that lived off Highway 17. Do you think we that's should stop going. by and see what's going on? Yeah, that's where we going now. My, my grandma lives she did, at 17. Do you think we should see if she did better than me or if she... You don't, you don't go on Facebook and check on that? I don't I used do to, that, Charlemagne. I'm I, a pastor. I used to sneak in that house. That, that one? I'm going to tell you why. That used to be my... 
girlfriend used to live right there. Yeah. Uh, in, over there. I don't even think that's the same house. My girlfriend used to live over there. Not the one, not my wife now, but just the girl I used to date. Did you and, have both at the same time? No, or? no, this was before my wife. But I used to ride my bike all the way from my mom's house, all the way up here, which is about five, six miles. And she used to stay with her grandma across the street, and I would sneak into her grandma's house. <laughs> 17A is so different now, man. Like, this is what my grandmother used to live at. She's dead now. This is so. It's, it, it, this is like why I come to meditate. But it's so sad. Like when I talk about returning to my core, mm -hmm. this is why I come to sit on my grandma's porch and meditate. But it's so sad because this 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 used to be full of so much life. Right. Like now nothing. Yeah. Like literally. Wow. Nothing. Zero. Zilch. Nada. When did your grandmother die? 2006. 2006, yeah. 2006. I used to sit in this field right here and act like I was taught. I, I used to act like this was an audience. I used to act like this whole field was an audience. Oh, you had rock and this concerts, was my stage. Didn't you? Yes. <laughs> I used to do it right here. And it, this, it, this field used to seem so big to me. But now, you'd stand right there? Stand right there. Would you have a little boombox? Nah, I would just be air guitar. <laughs> acting like I'm performing to a large crowd. Even back in the day, this porch used to seem huge. Like, because there used to be a bunch of us on the porch. Like, when it would rain really hard, we'd all just be sitting on the porch. You remember, it used to get, like, real dark. Yeah, terrible dark. Oh, super thunderstorms, <laughs> like, and we'd all just be sitting on this porch. But you still come out and sit on this porch today? All the time. All the time, just for meditation purposes. I, it's funny, because I, I haven't been in the house in a while. That's because it's kind of depressing, you know what I'm saying? But I used to just sit on this porch, man. I mean, I, even when I come home right now, I sit right there, I pray, I meditate. So when you call it in the book, connecting with your core, yep. you're you know, dealing with whatever, you're dealing with industry stuff or success, mm -hmm. and you come back here and what do you get? It makes you feel smaller again? Yes, and I, that's why I never want to lose that. I never want to lose that, that feeling of being from a small town. Because mm -hmm. it's a certain energy that we have coming from a small town. I talk about it in the book. Like, a lot yeah, of times. What do you think we get from that? What's our. We're very appreciative. Yeah. This right here lets you know where you come from and it just makes you appreciate when you're in those big moments, so to speak. It makes you feel vulnerable, too, though. I think it makes you feel human again. I think a lot of times we deal with a lot of guilt. Like when you, um, when you reach a certain level of success. I mean, anything I've ever written down, long term goals, short term goals, I've achieved. Nationally syndicated radio show. I've had a, a late night television show on, on MTV2. You know, I put out a New York Times bestselling book. So it's just like, I'm, I'm, I'm happy, but then you find yourself uh, feeling bad because it, it's certain moments where you don't feel like you appreciate it like you should. That's what you makes think me think it's feel really good. being ungrateful or just being anxious about being able to manage all of it? I think you're right. I think you just put it in, hey, you put it in perspective for me. You're, you just, you're anxious about needing to manage all of it and you don't want to, you don't want to lose it. You don't want to get to that. You don't want to be that person that gets to that point and just messes it all up. Man. Yeah, I had those moments too where like I'm getting so worked up about complications of ministry and and God will remind me, you prayed for this. Yeah. You're complaining yes. about what yes. used to be your prayer re request. Yes. It not only brings gratitude how far you've come, but it, it puts in perspective everything that your life has become since then. That's why I liked reading about Monk's Corner from your perspective because, you know, I have my own version of this. Mm -hmm. It's not my, my grandmother's porch, it's a trailer out in the woods of Macedonia. Did you ever go to Macedonia? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, my, my dad had a couple acres in Macedonia and he put like a semi-trailer and we went in and hung carpet on the inside, put a window unit, put a roof on it, generators to it, and my band would go play out there. And I can remember just going you know, four hours, five hours, six hours out there playing music. I'll still go out there, just drive out there, drive up and look at that red tractor trailer in the middle of the woods just to feel the feeling of wanting to make music or something to connect with people, yes. you know? Because now the pressure to connect with people, sometimes it feels like a burden, but if you can get back to that place where you are so desperate to connect with people, desperate to find a calling. What you said just now is absolutely how you feel. It's like. You, you're, you're from this place, Mount Corner, South Carolina, where you just want to be heard. Mm -hmm. You just want to connect with yeah. people. And this porch helps you shrink everything back down. Come on, man. Yeah. There's just energy here. And I just, I love, I love this. Like, I love this. Yeah, it's cool, man. You want to keep driving? 
So I went to First Baptist Church for a revival when I was 16 mm -hmm. and came forward for the invitation. That's when I got serious about my relationship with God. I said, the bug bit you? Yeah, but there was a guy that I met that was there with the revival team. He pulled me to the side and asked me, you know, about my beliefs and I was kind of doubting everything. He spent hours and hours with me just explaining the gospel. That was probably the beginning of my spiritual journey. I was starting to get really, really confused about why even have a religious point of view, why even have a spirituality. Mm. And right around the time I started asking all that questions, my friend, Cody, said, come with me to Revival tonight. I want you to meet this guy, Jody. What was Cody's last name? McSwain. Cody McSwain! You know? That's what I write about in my book. I just couldn't say his name. Really? B what'd you BK say BK Boyd. Yeah. And Cody. Yeah, yeah. That's who I used to hang with. Yeah, Cody. Cody! Those were the white guys. Cody was my guy. I talk about Cody in the book when I talk about how I used to hang out with these white kids. Uh-huh. And my cousins used to hate that I hung out with the white kid. Cody was my guy in middle school. Really? I used to be with him every day. Until they, they, my, my cousin scared him away. Because they used to beat up on me so much. <laughs> and Cody then was like, uh, no. In it's, middle school? In Berkeley Middle School. Yeah, right here. Right here. So, Ber Why? Berkeley Middle School is the worst part of my life. Why? It's scary. You don't think so? I mean, yeah, it was the worst part of mine. This, this one got me on the totally wrong path. Berkeley Middle School is what got me on the totally wrong path. You know Tony, you remember him? I don't remember, but I remember that name. I know, I know Javon, Tony. Yeah, he chased me into the hall one day and held me up like that. Why? I don't know, I stepped on his shoes. Jesus Christ. That's what this middle school was like. It was like, welcome to the jungle. People don't remember that. We going in or? Let's no, for a minute. people don't remember that. Because I, I tell people, I'm like, I grew up in Monk's Corner and you know, you had to go to school ready to fight every day. They, they don't believe me because it's Monk's Corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was terrible. <laughs> nah, it was bad. It was Why bad. Why was it so bad? I think because we didn't have nothing else to do. Yeah. Because you were a good kid before you came to this school. S sixth grade. Sixth grade, I was here. Berkeley right, Middle happened? School. And all my cousins who were the wannabe thugs pushed me around, beat up on me, slammed me, make my glasses fall off. And then after a while, I was like, oh, you can't beat them, join them. I remember, I remember one day, I, my glasses already were so crooked. So I, would, I, I wear my glasses crooked. And then one day they just dropped, shattered, I'm like, never looked back. And just started rolling with them. So from seventh so grade. So that was like the symbolic loss of your innocence. Absolutely. The glasses hit the That's ground. That's a fact. That's a fact. In seventh grade, started thugging with them. Yeah. Failed seventh grade, had to go to summer school. Eighth grade, still thugging. Failed eighth grade, had to go to summer school. I was a full-blown problem in school. I was a problem child. Yeah, but if you could rewind back and like not break the glasses and not go through that phase, would you have skipped that part of your life? Well, I don't know. I've seen Back to the Future. So I feel like if I went back and I changed anything, then I probably wouldn't end up right here. So you'd still break the glasses? I think I, I, think I would have to. You know what I mean? You don't want your kids to break the glasses. I don't want my kids to break the glasses, but that's what life's about, though. Life's about, I went through that so they don't have to go through that. Yeah. I feel like sometimes I walk through life like that because I walk through these halls like that. It's funny you say that, man, because even with, uh, with Darnell in the book, you, you know, he used to slam me. You? Yeah, in seventh grade. Yeah. You know, but he was just super strong. He'd just be slamming me, boom. So I would hate having to see him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Me too, man. I watched him beat a kid half to death out here one day, and it was like one of the craziest things I ever saw in my life. But I saw the attention he got from it. I saw how much he loved it. This is much nicer been an than what we had. I don't know. This is foreign to me. Yes, this is not place. what Berkeley Middle School looked like for us growing up. Not at all. No. Like, not even a little bit. The Christian faith that I first entered into when I was studying to be a pastor was so dogmatic. But what that does, it keeps you very ignorant to anybody who really holds any other beliefs because yeah, yeah. your whole goal is to convert them the whole time. Yeah, I mean, that's, but that's what I go back to when I talk about being morally honest. Regardless of your belief, regardless of your religion, you are able to be objective. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, but in my training, that was almost seen as backsliding. Mm. It was almost you're not being loyal to God's word or faithful to God's word if I'm not trying to change you if what you believe is contrary to me. So I'm really not listening to what you believe or trying to filter if I believe it's true. I'm really trying to show you where you're wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, and I, I realized that 
a lot of the people whose beliefs I was learning about, I didn't know anybody who believed it. I knew them through the filter of a book about them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a real problem right now. I think it's a problem with race as well. I feel like no one is able to talk without outrage. There's instant outrage about every discussion. Yeah, because people are listening with the intent to reply, not to truly understand. Exactly. And, and that's what I feel like, I gotta go back to being morally honest. Like being morally honest means sitting down and actually listening to a person and understanding where they're coming from. Yeah. So it's like, like those beliefs come early, man, because like we're standing here in this classroom. This is where I learned to be afraid of black people in this school. And I learned it because my dad taught me that. Really? Yeah. What I were, mean, listen, to this. yeah. What were the reasons? I like I well, like this conversation. No, my earliest memory of it was my dad never taught me that. Till I got to middle school and started getting beat up and stuff. Yeah, and one day I came home and I told him this thing happened on the bus, man. I was maybe one of three white kids on the bus. And I came home one day crying and he was saying, why are you crying? And I explained it to him, but I'd got beat up so bad on that bus, I was so angry and I came in and he shut the door and I'll never forget, he was like, I've been waiting to tell you this. And he unleashed on me and I'd never heard any of it. I knew he wasn't right, but at the time to explain my fear that I felt, it made sense it made of the sense. world I was Absolutely. in. It gave me Absolutely. a way to see the world. Absolutely. I mean, it's true. I'm thinking about it now. We used to grow up, our thing was, they used to be like, yo, punch, punch a white boy. Mm. Let's, be, let's go beat up a white boy. So that's probably what you got caught up in. Yeah, definitely. Because you, you probably just got randomly jumped for no reason and didn't know why. And I, I took some of it on myself, even though I didn't take it to the level that he did. Here I am in seventh grade. And I get the message, and it's really fear-based, like black people are to be feared. You know, you have a couple encounters and you tell yourself that. It's not an intellectual belief, it's an emotional belief. None of those beliefs were things that I studied. I never read a book that taught me to feel a way about black people and white people. It was my experiences. It was my experiences of fear and his experiences of fear. And for years I was so embarrassed that he taught me that, but he grew up in Orangeburg, South Carolina. I mean, his, his okay, childhood he, was He probably terrible. grew up during the Orangeburg he Massacre. Did. He did. Yeah. He grew up during the Orangeburg Massacre, but he had really tried to suppress it, but it was still there. And now he's seeing his kid afraid. It brings back all of his fear and it's compounded. So he teaches me what he knows. He teaches me what he thinks is right and what's true. And so I wonder how much of what we call belief has nothing to do with intellect. It has to do with emotions that, that have been embedded and then reinforced. Well, that's why you got it. You can't be afraid to unlearn. The first thing, though, with my conversion to Christ was all of that left my heart. I can say that before my dad died, I saw his heart change, too, mm. through watching my heart change. You know, he watched me sing in gospel choirs where I was the only white kid in high school, Voices of Unity. And it started to change his heart. When I was in college, I got to preach the sermon where my dad came forward to the altar. And one of the first things that happened, he really started to repent of his racism. I actually have a video of one of the last Father's Day that he was alive. He asked me to take him to church. So I skipped preaching at Elevation, came to Monk's Corner, drove him out into the country, all the way past uh, Cordsville. Cordsville. Yeah, all the way past Cordsville to a church where me and him were the only white guys in there. I have a video of him that I don't even know how I thought to take it at the time. But you can see my dad, who had all these beliefs his whole life, clapping in a church where we were the only white guys. And then, you know, about a year later, he died. He died of ALS. You know, I'm sitting there thinking about how many people didn't have the, the revelation that you had. You know what I'm saying? How many people were taught from this town to hate black people mm -hmm. and never, ever, ever came to a revelation? They just carried that with them throughout life. Even silently. Yeah. Because yeah. that's a part of being morally honest, right? Moral honesty is 5% of teaching me all the white, all white men are the devil. And I'm like, that, that just don't sound right. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the broad generalization. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, and moral honesty is somebody saying to you, there's no such thing as a good black person. And you're like... Nah, that don't. But I had too much experience at that point. You had too much experience. Like our experience saved yeah. us from ignorance. Yeah, absolutely. If we didn't have that, we could have just as easily owned that as our worldview. Absolutely. If you had never had dealt with any black people ever up until that point, yeah. you would have believed that. Yeah, I think a lot of the problems that come is the fact that, you know, what this country has done to us and hasn't apologized for. You understand what I'm saying? Like they didn't even give us a fair chance to like be a productive community. In, a, in America. That's why the best people to talk to are the white guys whose minds have been changed. Hmm. 
How do you get a white person to understand that has never been exposed to it? Just gotta tell them the story. And if they choose to do their own research and actually, you know, uh, look at it and educate themselves and acknowledge what really happened in this country, I think your mind would change. I think it's relationship. I think once you know one black person who shares their experience with injustice, mm -hmm. it changes because it becomes a lens through a person that you care about rather than an argument. And I think we're not allowing any context for people to ask dumb questions right now. And so there's very little growth happening. I agree with that. I, I, I do agree with that only because like, I remember when Lady Gaga asked, uh, she asked, this, she said, what can we, what can I do? What can white people do to make this better? And I always say, yo, use your privilege to combat prejudice. Yeah. And the way you Love use it. your privilege to combat prejudice is by educating yourself to the real history of this country mm -hmm. and then speaking out against it. Mm. You understand what I'm saying? Like, like, and that's what bothers me. Like, silence to me is a cosign. Like, if you're not gotcha. willing to speak out against the injustice that you see happening in this country to anybody, mm -hmm. then you're not even a real human being to me. Like, as a man, you know, I got to use my male privilege to combat misogyny, mm -hmm. you know? And, you know, as a straight man, I got to use my straight privilege to combat homophobia. So mm -hmm. as a white man, you got to use your privilege to combat racism. I, listen, man, I'm at the point in my life where all I care about is moral honesty at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care about race, religion, political party, none of that. Is it right? Is it wrong? You know what I'm saying? There has to be a God to decide that. There has to be a moral authority. It can't be just you and what you think, though. I think so. You think it can? Yeah, because I feel like God gives us all an innate ability to know what's right and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. and that's not about being a minority anymore. That's just about good versus evil. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like that's where we're at right now in this country. Mm -hmm. We're in a place where it's not about what, re what religion you are, what political party, conservative, liberal, none of that matters. It's about right and wrong, good and evil, God and Satan. The evil that is within me is what I'm most concerned about at this stage. I'm at age 37. Today's level of the evil. Yeah, because I don't trust myself. There's degrees, there's certainly degrees of evil or, yeah. or sin or wickedness, you know. They're all English words, and the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew, so people want to make the words all the same. You know, sin is sin. Well, what was sin? Sin was an archery term. It meant to miss the mark. So sin was not a category then. It was an actual term that the people understood. Mm -hmm. So now when we're getting into vocabulary lessons, we're talking about right and wrong, good and evil. My thing is there has to be uh, moral authority. There has to be someone who is the referee or the umpire because Jesus has this saying, you kill the prophets and think you offer God service. And I think there are people who are in that exact category. They really are calling evil good and good evil. It's just all of that, that that's all of the weirdness that gets into religion with me. And I think that's what kind of keeps people away from religion. And that's sad because keeping people away from religion is keeping people away from God. Because in order to even get them, in order to even get to that point where you say, I'm a spiritual person and not a religious person, you would have had to have had some type of religion. You know, it's funny what you just said when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. People always use that scripture to say, so, if you don't believe in Jesus, you can't get to God, which of course, as a Christian, we believe Jesus is the way to God. But he also said, I'm the gate. And what he was trying to say is like all the religious gatekeepers who think that they know who God is and who God accepts and who God doesn't, they're not the gate, I'm the gate. Mm -hmm. You know, He was expressing that as an inclusive statement, but people have used it so many times to shut, shut the door on people from even exploring faith. Mm. So that's a good conversation, man. I love it, like literally. I mean, donkey of the day is like a, a sermon, <laughs> isn't it? Don't you think? I, I keep hearing that, Pastor Carl always tells me Does that. he? I want you to meet somebody that had the biggest impact on me. He just came to see me. Oh, wow. Pastor oh, Mickey, this is Charlemagne. Charlemagne, nice to meet you. How are you, and son? And this is Miss Zeta. Hey, how are you? So, yes. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So What's listen. Going on? You know who this is? I'll, yes, sir. <laughs> I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what Pastor Mickey did. Okay. He brought me to be his youth minister when I was 16. Gave me my first chance to preach. He was the sponsor of the FCA, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Mm -hmm. So he saw me, thought I had potential. He goes over to- Sorry, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he, he goes over to my mom's house. He's like, let your son come be my youth minister. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take you to the building and show you. That's, that's where we're going next. Okay. He let me be his youth pastor. And that's how my whole ministry started. Wow. And he just stopped by to see me for a minute. Wow, that's what's now, up. Now, yeah. Charlemagne and I were in high school at the same time, really? but didn't know each other. 
And then okay. he went, he's, he's now one of the major radio personalities in hip hop music okay. and has written a New York Times bestseller. Wow. So what we're doing today, we are driving around and telling our story to each other of how, you know, like going to Berkeley Middle School, what that was like for him, how God gave each of us our calling and just sharing our stories. Yes, sir. Pretty cool. So where do you live now? New York. Well, New Jersey, but I work in New York. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah but all my family, my mom, dad, everybody's living in Moscow. He's one of the most brilliant communicators on the planet. Listen, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that one of Stephen's classmates kind of made it. You know? <laughs> You're awesome. Thank you. Love Listen, you. I know you on a tight schedule. Love you. Love you. Call Thank you. Good to meet you. Thank you. Love I'm glad you stopped by. Good to see y'all. I don't know. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. Yeah. Bye. 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 Love you. Bye. I love you too. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye, y'all. I'll drive so you Please. can eat. Oh, word. Thank you. Oh, I don't think you got no gas. I'll do no, it. it's a, maybe a seatbelt. Oh. Oh, I don't got my seatbelt on there. You worried but, about me running out of gas. But we used to, to save your life. I know, right? How many meals have you had at the Huddle House? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That Huddle Burger. Oh, man. You go to that milk. Chinese restaurant? Yeah. My you wife know? used to work right there. My wife used to work at KFC. She did? I don't think I've ever eaten at Gilligan's, y'all. But yeah, I have. I ate there last night. It was good? Yeah, it's all you can eat shrimp. Pastor Mickey, who you just met, this this is the Woodman of the World building, where he was pastoring, you know, maybe 20, 30 kids. And I would come here on Wednesday night and teach them Bible study. That's where I started my ministry. Wow. Yeah, I'll show you. I was a song leader too. So like I would lead the hymns. I haven't been in here since. What is it building now? Well, it's Woodman of the World, which is like a, Social club. I don't know what they do in here now. Woodmen? Woodmen. Yeah, woodmen. This like, wasn't like logging? <laughs> I guess so. So it was just like folding tables, and we would feed the kids, and I would teach Bible study in here. But this is probably where I preached. This was the main worship center. It didn't have pews. It had chairs. That's crazy. Wow. Hadn't been in here in 20 years till right now. How's it feel? Well, I had to like lead the hymns, and I didn't know all the Baptist hymns because I was in the Methodist church, so my mom had to teach them to me. She would figure them out on the piano the night before. 16-year-old kid, man, and some yeah. dockers and some extra-large Tommy Hilfiger <laughs> up there, you know, old-school leading hymns. And I don't know why Pastor Mickey even let me do that. You know, like he, he just gave me a chance. At that point, that was when really I sensed I was gonna preach the rest of my life. I mean, it was very strong to me. I read a book around the same time that was about a pastor in New York, uh, the Brooklyn Tabernacle, Jim Cimbala. And he wrote a book about just being a pastor in the city. And there was a line in the book, he said, I despaired at the thought my life might slip by without God showing himself greatly on our behalf. And then he told the stories. And I just felt, felt it. I felt like this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna help people, I'm gonna be a pastor. And so I just started listening to as many preachers as I could, you know, like I stopped listening to as much music, I stopped playing in my bands as much. And I just came out here and this is where I learned ministry because on Friday nights there would be like church council meeting, 40, 50, 60 year olds around the table and me, this, you know, 16, 17 year old kid, right. just learning it all. But I mean, did you have something like that, a place like this where you found your calling? It was the studio, like being in that studio, like being in that microphone, hearing your voice recorded, and like being in there before I even got a chance to crack the microphone, just being an intern, like the guy that would go get everybody their pizza, go with people to different remotes to help them set up, like just being just in be that building. It. Yeah, just being in that building, watching them do what they do. I used to be the fly on the wall. I would just sit in the studio and watch them do their show. And then and I just realized, like, I, I, I really enjoy doing this. So when, when the music director, Ron White, came and asked me, he was like, yo, you ever thought about being on the radio? I'm like, no. He was like, you should really be on the air. I'm like, let's, let's do it. When you want me to start? And I wasn't scared at all. It just, it, it felt natural, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And I remember Tessa Spencer, you know, who's a big media personality here, called me and she was like, you sound really good. She was like, you sound really good. Like, and I've had the chance to tell her that a few times, but she don't, she don't understand the battery she put in my back. You know what I mean? Like she put a real battery in my back. That's so true, man. You know, like you got to meet Pastor Mickey a minute ago and I'll never forget him telling my mom, he said, um, I've never seen God's hand on someone like I see his hand on Stephen. 
wow. and that includes my own children. Wow. And I didn't even know what that meant at age 16, but it made me take everything seriously all of a sudden. And it made all of the petty stuff of like losing friends because maybe I wasn't gonna be involved in what I was involved in or just all the insecurity and everything. It gave me something to go off of, you know? He, he, he saw it and he spoke it and I wouldn't have seen it in myself. It's funny how when you sit back and you watch how God can direct your steps, so to speak. Like I thought I wanted to be a rapper. So I meet Willie Will. Willie Will tells me about D93 going to get an internship. So then I, I get the chance to be on the radio. Then Tessa tells me I sound great. And that's just all the spark I need. Like, like that's what my whole story is. My whole story is rooted in a, in, a, in a great foundation of spirituality. But then it was a whole lot of divine misdirection because I wasn't doing what God wanted me to do. And like I feel like for people to read that story and see me go all of these different places but end up where I ultimately feel like God wants me to be. And if you ask me right now, what does God want me to do? I know to serve. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You're just a, you're, you're a pastor. Yeah. But I feel like I do the same thing. I'm just not a pastor. Mm. You know, I'm just here to serve the needs of the public in some way, shape, or form. Like, and it, you'd be surprised how many times I pray before I speak. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I'll, I'll pray and ask God to, to, to say the right things at the right time. Because you still know that you're nothing without Him. Yeah, always. I'm constantly praying constantly asking God to put things on my heart, constantly asking God to give me direction. God knows he can tap you and you'll do it. I'm going to do it. Yeah. I'm going to do it because... You think that's all he's looking for? I think that's all he's looking for is somebody he knows he can tap. That's it. I've gone through this whole process, grown as a human being, grown as a man, and I, I feel like I'm really just starting a journey that's going to be greater. Yeah than anything I can ever imagine. Yeah. And I, and I, I kind of feel like you feel that way too. I, I do feel that way. All of the things that God has you doing, like he's a master of taking your life experiences and he knows what town you need to be born in and he knows what you need to not get from people. And in your case, he knew that you needed to not know how to do radio to do radio. He knows what education you shouldn't get, you know. And I'm just so obsessed with this idea of helping people understand that they have a calling as, as, as significant as ours. It doesn't have to be Instagram followers and it doesn't have to be a microphone because people will associate calling with fame or they'll associate calling with notoriety. And it's so much bigger than that. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that a mom can experience. It's something, it, I think it's much deeper than what you do, I think it's how you do it. I told the church the other day, I said, it matters more where you finish than where you started. But what matters more than either is how you get there. How you get there. I agree with everything you're saying. And you said something just now that clicked in me because everybody always asks me, you know, what was that moment you felt like you made it? And I was like, I don't. I feel like I've arrived. It has nothing to do with entertainment. It has nothing to do with radio. It has nothing to do with being a New York Times bestseller. It has nothing to do with television. I feel like I've arrived because I honestly feel like I know what it is to be a man and be a man that God wants to use. You know what I'm saying? I've arrived because I've I've arrived because I feel like I'm fully embracing being of service. The sphere you do it in and the sphere I do it in are very different. But I felt drawn to your story for that reason because here's a guy who actually grew up on the same streets as me, but I drove past places and he drove past places where both of our lives happened, where we never even knew each other. To me, it was interesting to say, how could we grow up in such a small place, you know, and then both go out and do what we feel like God has called us to do from the same place. Like this Monk's Corner thing shaped us and made us who we were, but if we had stayed only in what we knew in this town, we would never be doing what never. we knew. We probably would have never crossed paths to this day. Think yeah. about that. Yeah. If we both would have stayed in this town, with the mindsets we had, we probably would have never crossed We had to past. leave to meet. We had to leave to meet. Yeah. Well, touch somebody, say, come out of your corner. Stay, stay seated right where you are for a moment. I hope you enjoyed the tour of Monk's Corner. Only took 30 minutes. See the whole time. Uh, I want to thank Charlemagne for spending that time with me. and uh, I learned so much, but really it wasn't about our conversation at all. It was about your conversations, um, because I do believe that God is a conversationalist, and 
I believe he's still speaking today. I believe he speaks by his spirit, by his son, by others, by situations in our life. And I think it's a good thing sometimes to uh, do what Jesus did, tired as he was from the journey, to sit down, be humble, and listen. And listen. Where you stand depends on where you sit. And sometimes we don't sit with ourselves long enough to really know ourselves. So we start trying to be something that we're not. But if you would sit a little bit this week and ask God to take you back to your porch, your trailer, your core, some of you would find that God has brought you a long way and you owe him praise for what he's done, and you've been so unnecessarily burdened. But to reconnect with your core and and have a seat and just reflect on how far God has brought you can, can be a good thing. Sometimes I talk to 16-year-old Stephen, and he tells 37-year-old Stephen, shut up, quit complaining. Look at how much God has done for you and uh, brings perspective. Uh, sometimes I need to sit with, with somebody who seems different than me on the surface to find out that we have more common ground than the world would have us to believe. So it might be good this week to sit with someone who has a different experience than you, who votes differently than you, who worships differently than you, or doesn't worship at all. Jesus, tired as he was, he sat down. The disciples were surprised. John 4, 27 says, when they saw him speaking with a Samaritan woman, they were surprised to see him speaking with a woman. But no one asked. That's the problem. We don't ask. We don't ask. And Jesus cannot be the answer to a question that is not posed. And so if the church is to remain relevant, I think we got to come out of our corner sometimes. If Jesus did it, the only one who had a right to condemn sat down and had a conversation. If Charlemagne would be willing to sit down with me, if we could sit down together and talk, sometimes just sitting down and listening, this will help your marriage. There may be a teenager that needs to sit down and listen to your parents. There may, may be a parent that needs to sit down and listen to your teenager. But to sit down and listen and ask, how do you see this, rather than allowing this world system to feed us information divorced from relationship? Sit down and listen. Touch somebody say, I'm so glad I got to sit next to you today. Sit down and listen, and listen to God, because there's a calling on your life. There's a calling on your life. I hope you heard that loud and clear. There is a calling on your life, and it may not look like what you thought it would look like, but let's take a moment and put into practice this, this sit down and listen thing. We're here gathered together today watching online. Let's just take a moment and sit in the presence of God before we get up and leave and purses. Sit down and listen. Would you bow your head for a moment? Because I believe the Spirit of the Lord is in this place, and the Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of conversation. God has positioned you where He's positioned you and given you a calling in the earth, but it's so easy to become disconnected when, when we don't listen. We start walking by. Sight, not by faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the Word of God, and God is speaking. You don't have to compromise your conviction to listen to someone who's different than you. If that were the case, God would have compromised his conviction. He's holy, and we're not so much. But the Creator speaks to the creation through the person of Jesus, the Word made flesh. And Jesus sat down and spoke with a woman, because he came out of the box of religious expectation. That woman went into Samaria, and the whole town was turned upside down. God wants to use you in a great way. I'm going to give you just a moment as you sit there and listen. Pray that God would open our eyes and our ears to what he's doing in the world, ways we've been wrong, prejudice that we need to repent of, conversations we need to have, understanding that we see. We need you, Lord. Speak in these moments. 
Hey, thanks for watching. Two things I want you to do. First, click our logo to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video. Second, you can click the Give Now button to support the ministry and we'll be able to continue reaching people all over the world. Thanks again for watching.